Not too long ago, we examined games that are no longer available to buy because lawyers. Oh look, there it is now. But as it turns out, there are loads of other games you can't get your hands on anymore owing to weird and varied legal reasons. Some of these games are definitely better than others, but what they all have in common is that they got yanked from sale without so much as a buy your leave. How rude. So here are even more games that you can't buy anymore because lawyers? The world fell fast. The ones who stayed dead were lucky. You'd think making a zombie game would be easy. Baseball bat full of nails, barricade the doors, man is the real monster. Bosh. And yet, in early 2019, we found out that The Walking Dead rights holders were not happy with Overkill's The Walking Dead, the four-player co-op game made by Overkill and published by Starbreeze Studios. When the game was released in November 2018, after many delays, it received middling reviews from critics and customers alike. And just a few months later, Starbreeze's CEO was fired, blaming the devs and himself for the game's failings. Then, in February 2019, the game was delisted from Steam, one day after this statement was released by Skybound Entertainment, which is the company that owns the rights to The Walking Dead and was co-founded by The Walking Dead creator Robert Kirkman. As of today, we have terminated our contract with Starbreeze Studios and will discontinue all efforts on Overkill's The Walking Dead. We are exceedingly sorry to our fans and share their disappointment in the game. They weren't angry, they were just disappointed. When the game was taken down, Starbreeze released their own statements, wherein they explained why and when the game was being taken down, disclosed that they were working on an amicable solution, and misspelled The Walking Dead. Twice. <laughs> Alongside this statement, Starbreeze's acting CEO Michael Nurmark also noted that they were trying to resolve the issue of Season 2 content being released for those who had already bought the game. Should you browse Steam as of this video's release, you'll see the Season 2 content is available, but the original game cannot be bought, with the deluxe upgrade only available to those that already own the standard edition. The license loss also put a stop to the console release, pre-orders of which PlayStation had already started refunding days before it was cancelled, after Starbreeze announced an indefinite delay. Some legal things are still being resolved, but for now, the game is deader than that guy who got his head caved in with a baseball bat. Don't visualise it. I said, don't visualize it. There are too many. Naga, where are you, girl? I need your help. Beloved TV series don't always make an easy jump to video games, although that's no excuse for AMC not answering my letters about a Mad Men kart racer. Fans of spectacular animated series The Legend of Korra know this all too well. Hi. At least they do if they play the 2014 video game of the same name, which, like the show, follows hot-headed hero and martial artist Avatar Korra, who is able to manipulate or bend the elements of fire, earth, water and air. She uses this power to fight alongside her friends and keep peace in the land, which you'll agree sounds like a perfect setup for a video game. It could only be better if Korra also featured an in-universe team sport. Oh no wait, there totally is that exact thing. Sadly though, despite the brilliant source material and the game being built by Bayonetta developer Platinum Games, The Legend of Korra turned out to be an only okay video game. Nevertheless, it was written by show writer Tim Hedrick and canonically set between the series' second and third seasons, so this action brawler did offer a bit more Korra to fans hungry for anything set in the Avatar's element-flinging four-nation world. Plus, there were bits where you ride a polar bear dog called Naga. Duck, Naga. Or at least there were, until the game was yanked from sale faster than Korra lends metal bending in episode 6 of season 3. Too deep a cut? Too deep. Publisher Activision pulled Korra from digital stores with no warning in December of 2017, alongside a Transformers game, with the most likely explanation being that the rights to the Korra license expired, leading to the game being deleted from sale. <laughs> Doubly frustrating for Korra fans, however, was the fact that the game was a digital-only offering, so it's not possible to now grab the game on disc from a second-hand store, for instance. So, for those who missed out, the only Korra console game we'll be playing is the one in our imagination. <laughs> And let me tell you, it features a lot of Pabu the Fire Ferret and a lot of unlockable costumes for Pabu the Fire Ferret.
New generations deserve a chance to enjoy the biting satire and quotable comedy of vintage Simpsons, whether that be through TV, video games, or Instagram accounts full of dank memes. And in 2012, it appeared that one slice of beloved Simpsons history was about to be preserved for the ages. That slice was 1991's The Simpsons Arcade Game, developed by Konami and designed to A, separate paying punters from their stacks of quarters, and then, if there's time, B, tell the story of America's favourite family trying to rescue Maggie after a jewellery heist goes awry. Maggie! With its madcap visuals and action-packed brawls across famous Simpsons locales such as Moe's Tavern and the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant, The Simpsons Arcade Game is a treasured piece of both Simpsons and video game history. So when the vintage title was ported to Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, it was very good news for Simpsons fans. Groin-grabbingly good news! That's a Simpsons quote, it's important to point out. The console version came bearing extra gifts, like online play and even the rare Japanese version of the game, so it was quite the treat for collectors. For a little under two years, that is, because in December 2013, The Simpsons vanished once more, leaving gamers with no way of buying this arcade classic, save buying an actual arcade cabinet on eBay for thousands of dollars, then knocking through a wall in your house and reinforcing your floors to make room for it. seems very likely to be as humdrum as another case of expired licenses, but one that especially stings. After all, what idea would players have that the console version of a 28-year-old game would be on sale for such a fleeting span of time? What now for the gamer who simply wants to play a bonus game in which you slap the Simpson family awake? At least we'll always have the dank memes! Wait a second, this is just two good Simpsons jokes smushed together to make one unfunny joke. Still liking it. This isn't the kind of advisory capacity I had in mind. Be quiet. You can hear me in this? Indeed. I am the only one cursed so. Boulder, it is your turn to carry this burden. If development years on a game reach double digits, it usually means it's not going to be any good. This is what is known as the Duke Nukem Forever principle. Neon-filled action RPG 2 Human was announced in 1999. Originally slated to be a cyberpunk-style Sony PlayStation game, it was then marked exclusively for Nintendo GameCube before Microsoft acquired the rights in 2005. Keen to get the ball rolling, Microsoft released a trailer announcing not one, but three Two Human games at E3 2006. Two Human. This winter, the action trilogy begins. Too Human? More like Too Keen. This new looking too human was less futuristic and more mystical, as the game was set in the distant past and Norse mythology was added to the mix. But the game was delayed further and new trouble behind the scenes started to put the series in jeopardy. Too Human was being built by Silicon Knights in the ubiquitous Unreal Engine 3, which is made by Epic Games, the company that also makes Gears of War. In 2006, Silicon Knights sued Epic Games for breach of contract, saying that Epic had been sluggish and inadequate in supporting their use of Unreal Engine 3 and accusing them of spending their time and money making Gears of War instead. Which, having played Two Human and Gears of War, seems like it would have been time well spent. Then Silicon Knights said they started building their own game engine instead, resulting in development costs shooting up. When the case finally came to court in 2012, Silicon Knights were told that their lawsuit was only worth one dollar. Epic parried by submitting a counterclaim against Silicon Knights, complaining of copyright infringement, misappropriation of trade secrets, and breach of contract, a claim it went on to win. Not only did Silicon Knights have to pay up $4.45 million, but Epic Games also ordered it to recall and destroy all physical copies of Two Human. Which, you know, seems pretty harsh. I mean, it wasn't great, but, you know, 6 out of 10. In 2013, the digital version of the game and all its related content was removed from the Xbox Marketplace, and Silicon Knights closed in 2014, their dream of a Norse mythology-inspired gaming trilogy meeting with its own Ragnarok. Oh dear, maybe they should have played it more low-key? <laughs> Sorry. In the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, 
The Dark Lord Sauron forged in secret a master ring. And into this ring he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. The game Battle for Middle-earth was great news for anyone who loves Lord of the Rings, real-time strategy, or hearing Gandalf say the word power. One by one, the free lands of Middle-earth fell to the power of the ring. Delicious. Released in 2004, this top-down strategy game won over critics and players alike with a tasty cocktail of combat scenarios, from intimate dungeon crawls lifted straight from the source material... And they call it a mine. A mine! Two larger scale dust ups, like helping the Fellowship defend the elven realm of Lothlorien from goblin attack. Goblins approach the Northwest Bridge! Assemble your troops and prepare for the assault! Then in 2006, along came a sequel, which featured cut from the movie singing wood sprite Tom Bombadil as a summonable fighting unit. But, you know, there were also upsides. The two games are considered some of the finest Lord of the Rings games ever, but alas, like so many of their companions, were wrapped up in a more tangled web of licensing deals than even Shellob with a law degree could weave. At the time of the game's release, publisher EA had a deal to make Lord of the Rings games under a joint license with New Line Cinema and Middle Earth Enterprises, then known as Tolkien Industries, the company that owns the rights to certain elements of the original books. In 2010, that license expired, later passing to Warner Brothers, and EA's online service for the game was shut down on the 31st of December, ending the reign of these quality strategy games. And presumably ruining New Year's Eve for many Tolkien fans who decided to stay in. Battle for Middle-earth and its sequel may no longer be on sale, but the games maintain a fan community through unofficial servers and mods, which among other things update the naughty's graphics so that, for instance, it looks less like you're playing with Lego hobbits. Which you also can't buy. See our previous feature. Holy crap, Tom Bombadil's in this too! Capcom presents 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1! Perfect! When it comes to licensed games, superhero titles tend to be on shop shelves for about as long as the 2012 Spider-Man film stayed in pop culture memory. See, you've already forgotten about Andrew Garfield. But around 15 years after their initial arcade debuts, late 90s superhero fighting arcade classics Marvel Super Heroes and Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of Super Heroes were re-released on the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2012. Given a bit of an HD shine, these 2D fighting games brought together a whole host of heroes and villains from across both franchises, and showed off the beginnings of what turned into a pretty successful series, but this time with additional features. This included a new challenge system, because apparently having a fist fight with the Hulk isn't enough of a challenge. But the game didn't sell as well as hoped, and in April 2013, publisher Capcom said it would slow down on high definition reworks going forward, thanks to a drop off in sales for each new re-release. Just over a year later, Marvel vs. Capcom Origins was removed from the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live in December 2014, just two years after it came out. This is most likely because of the license running out, and with no financial incentive to renew, Origins joined other, older titles, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Marvel vs. Capcom 2, which were delisted the year before. Fortunately, on both occasions, gaming fans were warned ahead of time, with good guy Capcom releasing exact dates for when games would be removed, so fans could get them before they disappeared. And at least fans still have access to the current gen version of Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, where you can get Phoenix Wright to do this to Doctor Doom. The one who actually committed the crime is you! No alibi, no justice, no dream, no hope! No objections here. Uno, the classic card game, is coming to your PSP and PSP Go. Uno. Uno is a real-world game whose digital license has been passed around more than the cards in its pack. For example, for the Xbox 360, the game was first licensed to Microsoft from Hasbro in 2005, then EA had the license for a while, then it was removed after Ubisoft gained the rights in 2014. And that's a full Uno! I've never played Uno! In fact, many older versions of the game were taken down on various platforms due to the license moving to Ubisoft, but one version of the game was taken down in the beginning of 2013 for a very different legal reason. Who here remembers the PSP? You know, this thing! Oh cool, Nintendo DS! N no, 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 it's a PSP. Can we play Animal Crossing? N no, but we can watch Spider-Man 2 on UMD! 
Well, hackers really liked this device as they could find exploits in games to run homebrew software and get around Sony's security, e.g. to run pirated games in emulated games not officially released on Sony's stores. Typically, Sony would shut down these exploits as they were discovered. Then in late 2012, the PSP version of Uno was discovered to have such an exploit, a backdoor that could grant access to the entire console, and Sony found out not long after. So in early January 2013, the game was pulled from the storefront, so as to prevent future illegal use of the PSP. And whilst it is playable to those that already own it, it is unavailable to purchase to this day. Despite only being available in January for three days, it was that month's most downloaded PSP game in the USA, as people grabbed the game before Sony could take it down. But hey, it's not hard to be in the top five games on a console that isn't the Nintendo DS. Right, now where's the exploit that lets me play Nintendogs? Uno! Okay, okay. AMC, Pabu Kart Racer. I know what you're thinking. You don't own the license to Pabu, and you don't know what a kart racer is. But that's why we need to sit down and we can talk like rational human beings. Answer my letters, AMC. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, then uh, why not like and subscribe to the channel because we have loads more. Can you think of any other instances of games that you can no longer buy because of some bizarre legal hang-up. Honestly, it's so complicated. Very, very complicated indeed. Uh, if you enjoyed this, then uh, why not check out some of the other stuff we've made up here. Is a video from us. It's all about sports, in-game sports, like the one in Korra that you would totally uh, watch if they only existed in real life. And down here is a video from our sister channel, Outside Xbox. It's all about moments in games that were so frightening that we stopped playing. And if you enjoyed this, please do subscribe. We'll see you next time.